On Tuesday, August 18, 1944, in the shade of a magnolia tree said to have been planted by Andrew Jackson, Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman had lunch on the south lawn of the White House. Because of the heat, Roosevelt suggested they take off their jackets. So it was in their shirt sleeves, seated at a small round table set with crystal and silver from the Coolidge years, that the two men posed together for photographers for the first time. In background, interests, personality, in everything from the sounds of their voices to the kind of company they enjoyed to the patterns of their careers, they could not have been much more dissimilar. Roosevelt was now in his twelfth year in office. He had been president for so long and through such trying, stirring times that it seemed to many Americans, including the junior senator from Missouri, that he was virtually the presidency itself. His wealth, education, the social position he had known since boyhood were everything Harry Truman never had. Life and customs at the Roosevelt family estate on the upper Hudson River were as far removed from Jackson County, Missouri, as some foreign land. Roosevelt fancied himself a farmer. To Truman, Roosevelt was the kind of farmer who had never pulled a weed, never known debt or crop failure, or a father's call to roll out of bed at 5.30 on a bitter cold morning. Truman, with his Monday night poker games, his Masonic ring and snappy bow ties, the Main Street pals, the dry Missouri voice, was entirely undeniably middle American. He had only to open his mouth and his origins were plain. It wasn't just that he came from a particular part of the country geographically, but from a specific part of the American experience, an authentic pioneer background, and a specific place in the American imagination. His Missouri, as he loved to emphasize, was the Missouri of Mark Twain and Jesse James. In manner and appearance, he might have stepped from a novel by Sinclair Lewis, an author Truman is not known to have read. To anyone taking him at face value, this might have been George F. Babbitt having lunch with the president under the Jackson Magnolia. Roosevelt, on the other hand, was from the world of Edith Wharton stories and drawings by Charles Dana Gibson. He was the authentic American patrician come to power, no matter that he loved politics or a night of poker with the boys quite as much as the senator from Missouri, or that he too was a mason and chose a bow tie as many mornings as not, including this one. Roosevelt had been given things all of his life, houses, furniture, servants, travels abroad. Truman had been given almost nothing. He had never had a house to call his own. He had been taught from childhood and by rough experience that what he became would depend almost entirely on what he did. Roosevelt had always known the possibilities open to him, indeed how much was expected of him, because of who he was. Both were men of exceptional determination, with great reserves of personal courage and cheerfulness. They were alike to in their enjoyment of people. The human race, Truman once told a reporter, was an excellent outfit. Each had an active sense of humor and was inclined to be dubious of those who did not. But Roosevelt, who loved stories, loved also to laugh at his own, while Truman was more of a listener and laughed best when somebody else told a good one. Roosevelt enjoyed flattery. Truman was made uneasy by it. Roosevelt loved the subtleties of human relations. He was a master of the circuitous solution to problems, of the pleasing, if ambiguous, answer to difficult questions. He was sensitive to nuances in a way Harry Truman never was and never would be. Truman, with his rural Missouri background, and partly, too, because of the limits of his education, was inclined to see things in far simpler terms as right or wrong, wise or foolish. He dealt little in abstractions. His answers to questions, even complicated questions, were nearly always direct and assured, plainly said, and followed often by a conclusive, and that's all there is to it, an old Missouri expression, when in truth there may have been a great deal more to it. Each of them had been tested by his own painful struggle, Roosevelt with crippling polio, Truman with debt, failure, obscurity, and the heavy stigma of the Pendergasts. Roosevelt liked to quote the admonition of his old headmaster at Groton, Dr. Endicott Peabody. Things in life will not always run smoothly. Sometimes we will be rising toward the heights, then all will seem to reverse itself and start downward. The great fact to remember is that the trend of civilization is forever upward. Assuredly, Truman would have subscribed to the same vision. They were two optimists at heart, each in his way faithful to the old creed of human progress. But there had been nothing in Roosevelt's experience like the night young Harry held the lantern as his mother underwent surgery, nothing like the Argonne or Truman's desperate fight for political survival in 1940. Roosevelt, as would be said, was a kind of master conjurer. 
He had imagination. He was theatrical. If, as his cousins saw him, Harry Truman was Horatio, then Franklin Roosevelt was Prospero. Truman was often called a simple man, which he was not. I wonder why we are made so that what we really think and feel we cover up, he had once confided to Bess, and some who knew him well would, in retrospect, feel he had withheld too much of himself from public view, and that this was among his greatest limitations. But in contrast to Franklin Roosevelt, and it was Truman's destiny from this point forward to be forever contrasted to Roosevelt, he was truly uncomplicated, open, and genuine. In private correspondence, Truman could be extremely revealing, whereas Roosevelt never dropped the mask, never poured his heart out on paper as did Truman in hundreds of letters and notes to himself, even after it was clear that he was to be a figure in history. To many Americans, Truman would always be the little man from Missouri. Roosevelt was larger than life, even in a wheelchair. He had the force of personality that Truman so admired in a leader and to a degree rarely equaled in the ranks of the presidency. This, too, was something Truman knew he did not have himself, as he knew he had no exceptional intellectual prowess, as had, say, Henry Wallace. "'I am not a deep thinker as you are,' he had told Wallace only a day earlier when asking Wallace for his help in the campaign ahead. Yet Truman, as Republican Congressman Joe Martin would write, was smarter by far than most people realized. In some ways, Truman would have felt more in common, more at ease, with the earlier Roosevelt, Theodore, had he been host for the lunch. They were much more alike in temperament. They could have talked books, army life, or the boyhood handicap of having to meet the world wearing thick spectacles, or possibly the old fear of being thought a sissy. Like Theodore Roosevelt, and unlike Franklin, Truman had never known what it was to be glamorous. The contrast in appearance between the president and his new running mate was striking. Truman looked robust, younger than his age. The president, though only two years older, seemed a haggard old man. He had returned only the day before from his long mission to the Pacific, and from the sag of his shoulders, the ashen circles under his eyes, it was clear the trip had taken its toll. Truman, who had not seen the president in more than a year, was stunned by how he looked. Even the famous voice seemed to have no energy or resonance. The lunch was sardines on toast. The conversation dealt mainly with the campaign ahead and was not very private or revealing, since the president's daughter, Anna Roosevelt Bettiger, joined them. Truman would later repeat only one remark of Roosevelt's. The president told him not to travel by airplane, because it is important that one of them stay alive. To his dismay, Truman noticed that Roosevelt's hand shook so badly he was unable to pour cream in his coffee. The president looked fine and ate a bigger lunch than I did, Truman told reporters afterward, already becoming party to the fiction of a steady hand at the helm. To Bess and Margaret, who were still in independence, he described how Roosevelt had given him two roses, one for each of them. You should have seen your pa walking down Connecticut Avenue with his hat blown up by the wind, so he looked like a college boy, gray hair and all, and two rosebuds in hand, he wrote, as if he hadn't a worry in the world but arriving at his Senate office, he appeared noticeably upset. He was greatly concerned about the president, he told Harry Vaughan, and described how Roosevelt's hand had trembled so, pouring his cream in his coffee, that he put more in the saucer than in the cup. His hands were shaking and he talks with considerable difficulty. It doesn't seem to be any mental lapse of any kind, Truman said, but physically he's just going to pieces. In September, Truman took Eddie McKim to a White House reception, where McKim was so shocked by the president's appearance he wondered if Roosevelt would live long enough to be inaugurated, if Henry Wallace might become president after all. On the way out, as they were walking through the gate, McKim told Truman to turn and look back, because that was where he would be living before long. "'I'm afraid you're right, Eddie,' Truman said, "'and it scares the hell out of me.'